Good morning. Welcome to this week's View on Africa. My name is Stephanie Walters. I'm the head of the Peace and Security Research Program at the Institute for Security Studies. And today we're going to be taking a look at some of the latest developments in the Democratic Republic of Congo, specifically on the questions of the electoral process. So I'll be looking at three different uh, issues. First of all, where are we on election preparations? Where are we on some of the key technical benchmarks uh, we need to meet if the elections are due to take place before the end of the year? Where is the political environment at this point? What are some of the new developments, some of the new concerns that have uh, arisen over the last few months? And then finally, um, have a quick uh, look at the responses of SADC and the African Union so far and make some uh, um, quick recommendations about where SADC and the AU might be able to provide some useful uh, input and recommendations. So um, without further ado, we are now um, in the end of May. Elections are still scheduled to take place on December 23rd this year. Um, where do things stand with election preparations? First of all, the voters' roll. Uh, the voters' roll was completed a few months ago. Um, it has um, been reviewed by the Independent Electoral Commission in the DRC. About five million voters were, or five million um, doubly registered people were taken off that register, and so were 900,000 minors, giving us about four, 41 million voters, according to the Independent Electoral Commission. The um, uh, inter international organization of the Francophonie is now doing an independent audit of that voter's role, which is a, a very important uh, next step. But in the meantime, the Congolese parliament has adopted the, um, the, the law regulating uh, allocations of, of, of political seats based on the uh, voter's role that the CNI has audited. Um, and this is controversial because there is a sense from the opposition and civil society that the voters' role has not yet been uh, adequately uh, audited by an independent body and that we should have waited with that new law to decide how many seats there are per circumscription until that independent audit had taken place. And some of the irregularities that have been noted by civil society organizations and some external observers is that there has been a, a notable increase in the number of voters in certain circumscriptions, notably uh, South Kivu, uh, Katanga, and several other areas, about um, an increase of about 40% of the voters, whereas the national average increase since 2011 is 20%. Is 20%. And so this uh, raises the question of whether or not there has been some attempt to influence the number of voters in areas that might be more likely to vote for Kabila and to suppress the registration of voters in areas that are less likely to vote for Kabila. So this is one of the key issues that's uh, ongoing and that um, has been uh, criticized by various different key players. The second issue, and we touched on this a little bit last time, is the introduction of the electronic voters' machines. Um, now, there have been a variety of different issues that have arisen around that, procurement questions, etc. But fundamentally, it's a question of whether or not this is, a const is actually constitutional under, under the DRC's current constitution. Uh, there is no mention in that constitution of um, uh, voter, electronic voter machines being allowed to be used, and so that's one point of contention. There is concern that it is being introduced at a relatively late stage and without any kind of real consultation with key players, international or domestic, because it will be used as a tool to try and influence the outcome in favor of the Kabila government. Um, the government has argued that it is simply a lot easier to transport these machines to the various different um, polls in the country, which are over 100,000, there'll be over 100,000 polls, um, and that it would take uh, much more, it would be more costly and it would take more air transport, etc., to try and physically transport the ballots, uh, physical ballots, because there are likely to be over about 20,000 candidates in the various different elections. Um, this is something that they have done in the past, in other words, used paper ballots, so it's not necessarily a better argument now that they can't do it. Um, that's one of the concerns. There's also the question of just how familiar voters will be with that technology. We're talking about people living in, in, in very rural, isolated areas who have perhaps never used a smartphone and who will then be confronted with an electronic voting machine that might be quite complicated um, and how much time it will take for them to be able to use it. And of course, the question of who would might provide them with the assistance when they try to use it and whether that could mean that their vote is influenced. So this is a very big big sticking point, these, these voting machines. Um, there is also the question of financing. The Congolese government has now said that it intends to finance these elections itself. 
Um, these elections are uh, estimated to cost over one billion uh, US dollars. That's a uh, Congolese government estimate. Of course, it's long been a big um, issue for, for donors who would like to support the process because there was so many delays in, the, in first getting the election date, but also in some of the technical benchmarks. And so donors aren't quite sure at what point they might feel comfortable in financing aspects of the election. And there's also the, the, the dilemma of whether or not they're financing a process that will actually be free and fair and have credibility, or whether that won't be the case. Um, the, the UN has uh, put out a report earlier this month, the UN Secretary General, um, saying that it is very concerned about this financing issue, even if the Congolese government does uh, finance um, the process. At the moment, its disbursals to the Independent Electoral Commission and other bodies associated with the electoral process is much lower than it needs to be. The estimate is that uh, the Congolese government needs to disburse $60 million a month in order for the process to stay on track and to meet the December 23rd deadline. At the moment, it appears to be dispersing an average of about $22 million, so much below what is, what is needed. So concerns there, uh, both about where international donors may provide support and also about the, the way in which the, um, the government is dispersing. So um, there are other issues with that as well. UNDP is one of the key players. It's meant to provide about 60 million US dollars in support, not all to the Independent Electoral Commission, some of it also to civil society actors and to electoral observers, independent electoral observers. The Congolese government and UNDP have not been able to find common ground on those issues with the government not happy about the idea that UNDP funds might go to independent electoral observers. So those funds also at the moment um, still not having been unblocked. Another issue is that there won't be a diaspora vote. Um, this is something that we had that had been considered and that the Constitution does provide for. But again, the Congolese government making the argument that it's logistically simply too heavy, it's too costly, um, and opposition uh, parties and civil society responding that it's more likely to have been motivated by the fact that a large percentage of the diaspora is believed to be supporters of opposition groups and not of Kabila. But for now, no diaspora vote. Another big um, issue in the preparations is the registration of political parties. Um, that has taken place over the last few months. Um, and this is an issue because what we've seen in the last year is a, a how shall I say, a, a dédoublement, as they say in French, a, a reproduction of, of, of various different political parties. So whereas there used to be one UDPS, there are now four. Um, of course, this is an issue when you go to the polls, which UDPS will be on the ballot, which UDPS will, 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 have, the, um, will have that original name. And so it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, an opportunity to divide votes for, for, for the main opposition parties um, and to, to undermine the opposition in general. Now, that um, registration process went to the CNSA, which is the follow-up committee on the implementation of the December 31st political accord in the the DRC. Just a reminder that that particular committee was um, established by the government essentially. In other words, the government decided which representatives from which opposition parties it would um, uh, would be represented. And so it's not considered to be uh, uh, to have credibility. Many of the parties that are represented are those that are very close to the government. So it's not the independent um, uh, unifying uh, follow-up committee that was meant to be there. It's highly politicized. So they have now gone through that list and they have made recommendations about which parties are the legitimate parties, led by whom, and which should be allowed to participate in the elections and which should not. Those recommendations have gone to the Minister of the Interior. The Minister of the Interior, uh, Henri Mouva, is uh, a key player. He's the Vice Prime Minister, a key player in the Kabila, uh, Kabila's inner circle. Um, and so we'll have to see how he chooses to decide which of the key opposition parties um, uh, are going to be given accreditation to participate in the election. Another big point of contention there. And finally, um, to the political environment. Um, the political environment in the DRC hasn't changed substantially since the beginning of the year. We still have a ban on political marches and political assembly. 
Uh, we still have um, key opposition figures in uh, prison. We have crackdowns on human rights observers, on the media. Um, we have a continuing judicial process against one of the main opposition uh, candidates, Moïse Katumbi. Uh, and more recently, we have Henri Mouva, the Minister of Interior, accusing Moïse Katumbi of uh, supporting uh, armed groups in the eastern DRC. Um, so no real change in the political environment there. The UDPS was, the UDPS led by Felix Cesicchetti, which is uh, the one that is considered to be the, the real UDPS, was able to hold a political meeting in May in Kinshasa. Um, and, and this was, of course, important. But at the same time, Mwiz Katumbi's party was not allowed to hold a meeting in Lubumbashi. So I think we must see that as the kind of window dressing that um, the government is now engaged in, in an attempt to try and deflect uh, criticisms that uh, political freedoms don't exist in the DRC. I think we must be very careful about um, interpreting that as a real opening of the political space which it, it really isn't. Um, the Comité Laïque Catholique, which is the, the um, uh, an arm of the Catholic Church um, that has been heavily involved in, in um, protests and political assemblies and organizing um, marches are also earlier this year, apolitical marches, so under an apolitical banner, has now said that it will return to organizing those kinds of events. It had, um, had, had taken a bit of a hiatus in the last few months, but it has, or it has announced that it will resume those activities shortly. This will be the real bellwether for whether or not um, political freedoms are going to be more tolerated as we head up towards elections. So we have um, um, some issues to, to, to look at there. Um, some of the new um, controversies that have come up and some of the concern, some new concerns. Um, one is that there ha it has emerged in the last few weeks a new group pushing for a referendum before the elections are held. Now, it's, it's quite a clever move. This is a, a small group associated closely with the ruling party. And the grounds on which they are requesting that that referendum be held is to review the nationality clause in the Constitution. Now, the nationality clause says that you cannot hold dual nationality in the DRC and that it disqualifies you from being a political candidate. And this, of course, is a key issue when it comes to Moise Katumbi, who was found to have held uh, Italian citizenship. Now, he's disputing that, but either way, um, the, the, the kind of move here is to um, make it seem as though it's a useful referendum to hold that could unblock the way for Moise Katumbi. But of course, the concern is that in that referendum, the question will not just be about nationality, but it may also actually be about whether or not term limits should be scrapped. Um, and as we know, that is really the origin of much of what's going on here. There is a two-term limit in the DRC. It's part of the constitution that was adopted in 2005, and it cannot be amended unless there is a referendum. Uh, so that is one of the, the big concerns that, that, that is now starting to emerge. Will, will the majority try and slip, ha hold this referendum, and will it try to slip into that referendum some idea um, or the, the question of term limits? Now, just a caveat there, it is not that easy to organize a referendum in, in the DRC. It is essentially the same as holding an election. Uh, so I think that um, to do that in the next six months is, is, a, is a very uh, tall order, um, but it is something that we are, we are watching closely. Um, another uh, development um, that may allow, may, may be a way in which the, the um, ruling majority may be trying to allow Kabila to run in the next election is uh, related to the recent reconstitution of the Constitutional Court. Uh, one judge had passed away and there was a natural rotation of other judges whilst two judges resigned in protest against uh, politicization of, of that institution. The Constitutional Court is the highest body in, in the DRC, highest judicial body, and it will be the one that will be adjudicating any kind of electoral disputes should there be any arising from the, the upcoming election. Um, the new appointees are both very close to President Kabila. Uh, one in particular, Nober Nkulu, um, has worked very closely with Kabila over a number of different years and is close to his cabinet advisor, um, and uh, sorry, his chief of staff, um, and so is certainly someone who's seen as highly political. Um, the Constitutional Court has not been an independent body for some years. Um, there is a structure by which, or a, a system by which, um, 
it is meant to the, the members of the constitutional court are meant to be appointed by the National Assembly and by the presidency to ensure some balance, um, but that's been largely uh, disrespected. And of course, there's a majority uh, of the ruling party in parliament as well. Um, the idea or the, the concern with this particular appointment is that there may be an attempt that uh, to submit to the court a review of whether or not the constitutional amendment which took place before the 2011 election and which changed the requirements for um, uh, which scrapped essentially a runoff requirement in the event of a of a of less than a two-thirds majority whether that amendment means that the 2011 election was the first time that kabila received a mandate and that in fact he is due for a second mandate so it's a manipulation of the legal texts and um, it would then be submitted to a politicized constitutional court which might rubber stamp it. Um, and so that is the other big concern that, that is, has, has arisen recently. Um, we, we, we can't assess whether either of these are likely or how likely either of them are, but it's certainly something um, that we're watching very closely. We've seen it since about 2013 a number of different attempts coming from the ruling elite to try and change these texts that, that, that limit this mandate. So uh, I think we can't rule out that this might be one of the avenues that might still be sought before the election is held. Of course, just a quick um, note on that. We are due to have the declaration of political candidates um, running in the presidential and other elections on the 23rd of June. So um, there isn't that much time left. Um, Kabila and the ruling party will have to declare who their, uh, their candidate is for that election, so that is an important date that is coming up, if it is in fact respected by the ruling party as well. So what can SADC and the African Union do? I'll focus only on them. Of course, we can talk about other international actors in the question and answer period. We had a SADC summit um, last month. Um, of the Troika, not, not of the full heads of state, but of the Troika, where the DRC was very much on the agenda. Um, publicly, what came out of that um, summit was, an, in fact, I think, a statement that was quite supportive of Kabila. There was a public acknowledgement that the Independent Electoral Commission um, and the government had made a lot of progress on organizing the elections. And there was a very big concession to Kabila, which was the, uh, um, the, the fact that Sadek withdrew the special envoy that had nominated to um, act as Great Lakes envoy from Sadek, which was something that Kabila had been opposed to and he had been refusing to meet uh, the special envoy, who is uh, Hifikipunye Pohamba from Namibia. Um, so that is a big concession to Kabila that was made very publicly. We are, behind the scenes, we understand that Angola, South Africa, um, and Zimbabwe were, were very clear with Kabila that these elections have to take place and that he should not be standing in them. Um, and this message was brought across, across quite clearly. Um, but we don't really know what that will translate into. Um, we, we understand that, of course, um, SADC would like to remain, and, and I, I think SADC, but also key member states like Angola, South Africa, and Zimbabwe, but really Angola and South Africa, want to remain able to have an open dialogue with Kabila as we as we move towards the elections. And so that would militate against public diplomacy, uh, public statements criticizing him, um, which he might perceive as a humiliation or as a chastising and which might lead him to turn his back on Sadek. Um, so we understand that, that, that the need for quiet diplomacy is there, but it remains to be seen what, what Sadek is really going to do. There are other issues um, in the DRC, notably uh, questions of human rights violations, that can be addressed without um, necessarily speaking about the incumbent, and I think Sadek really needs to start um, doing precisely that. Um, in order to, 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 really, to, to really weigh in on, on, on what's going on in the DRC. The DRC government has requested that SADC send electoral observers. We're talking about about 300 yeah. longer-term electoral observers who might arrive about a month, six weeks to a month before the election takes place. Um, in my view, it's important that they go, but uh, that is going to be too little too late. So if SADC doesn't insist on a liberalization of the political environment, um, if it doesn't um, insist on respect for human rights and on um, a free playing field with regards to campaigning, um, I think that sending electoral observers six weeks before the elections take place is really uh, an ineffective way of trying to ensure that those elections are credible. Um, so I, I, I think we, 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 we do um, want to see SADC uh, getting more involved there um, uh, rather soon and, and, and sending some kind of strong message as well. Um,
with regards to the African Union, there has always been this reticence um, of by the African Union to get involved, too, too involved in, in uh, crises that are considered to be SADC crises. I think that the DRC uh, straddles many different regions, um, certainly Central Africa. It is a member of SADC, of course, and it has used, uh, it has chosen to be, uh, to have, have its crises discussed in SADC, I think, quite willingly because it sees it as a, or used to see it as a club of people who um, wouldn't necessarily be critical. But, but the DRC is a continental issue, um, and the African Union has to wait in here. We haven't seen very much from the African Union since uh, 2016 on the DRC when there was a, an AU uh, mediation attempt um, and I think it is it is really very much time for it to start taking a more a, a closer closer eye a closer look at what's going on there. Certainly if we have an attempt for there to be a referendum that re reviews term limits or if we have a constitutional court judgment on um, 2011 having really been Kabila's first mandate, we need to see SADC and the African Union stand up about that. They, I think that um, that th there should be a zero tolerance policy uh, for that kind of for either of those um, initiatives. Of course, there is the question of sovereignty, um, but we, we we know that the, that these that these um, these um, processes would not be processes that reflect the voice of the Congolese. And so I think both the AU and SADC have have space absolutely have the space and also the, the legal texts to be able to speak critically uh, about that. Um, I, I want to end there, but I do want to do just one thing, um, which is show a video um, that has been um, released in the last few weeks by the Kabila government. Um, it comes along with some um, with banners all over some of the big cities in the DRC, banners that look a lot like campaign banners. Now, the political campaign period hasn't started yet. It's important to remember that. So um, that's one issue. The other issue is why are we seeing propaganda around the person of Joseph Kabila if in fact he's not going to stand and he isn't allowed to stand and though I'll, I'll leave you with this video with I th which I think you'll probably um, also view as what seems very much like a campaign video um, and I hope that you can see this sorry for the technology but this is the best that we can do at the moment cet homme a hérité d'un Congo en piété et exemple cet homme a réunifié et pacifié les Congo Cet homme a refondé l'État en lui donnant une nouvelle constitution et des institutions stables. Cet homme garantit la démocratie effective au Congo. Plus de 600 partis politiques, 2000 associations et syndicats, 400 radios et télévisions, 2000 titres des journaux dans une expression libre. Cet homme a réhabilité et construit des infrastructures. Cet homme a permis aux particuliers à travers la stabilité économique de construire des villas, des immeubles. Cet homme a recruté, formé, équipé les FARDC. Aujourd'hui, dixième armée d'Afrique. Cet homme est en train de doter les pays des infrastructures dignes d'un grand pays au cœur de l'Afrique. Cet homme a rendu hommage à nos artistes. Cet homme est indispensable pour les Congos. All right. Thank you very much for listening. I think